at CFRC, and I'm here to welcome Zoom to the Grad Club. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, well, I moved from Calgary to Hamilton, and that's where I recorded my debut album. And the community was so welcoming, and so many people lent their hand for the creation of the record, or at least just getting me to the stage of recording it. And, and it was just, it was a very supportive uh, music scene. And uh, I moved there from there to Toronto during the pandemic. And both music scenes are just so kind. That's the only way I can describe it because I haven't had a bad experience with either cities. Okay, so the story of music saving someone's life, that's, that's an old story that we've heard mm -hmm. time and time again, whether it's the listener or the musician. I know that matters to you. Can you just take us through a little bit about when you knew that moment had happened for you, when you realized that your life had been saved by music? Um, there, there's been a lot of moments of like um, gratitude where I've been like, wow, my life, like I'm, it, my music and recovery had changed my life, but now I'm seeing it change other people's lives. When I start to get um, DM messages from indigenous youth reaching out, being like, I haven't seen someone like me play shoegaze music on a stage before. And I was like, yeah, me too. And that's why I'm doing it. And so it's moments like that. Um, and there's been a lot of those messages that have come through to me from indigenous youth, but also any youth and, and all kinds of people. Like there was a guy at field trip who's this English dude and he was an elder man and he said that he ran a marathon listening to my record. And I was like, oh wow, okay. Like, you know, like, and I only listen to music that makes me inspired or something. So it was like. Is there any pressure with that? I think um, I think with the youth, there is a lot of pressure to keep, uphold this image of a picture perfect person. But I've learned that um, humility and and showing that you're just a normal person is okay, you know. So I do make mistakes still, and I people see it, and um, so that's part of it too. So you grew up on reserve, and I'm thinking about kids growing up there now. And do you feel that they have more access now to a global sound that maybe um, even just two generations ago just didn't have access to, and so that's changing everything. I've thought I've thought about this a lot. Every time that I visit the reserve, I'm like, how strong is the Wi-Fi here? You know, I'm like, what is the internet connection like? Because I think that is what helps bridge those the, the connection between the reservation and the outside world. But I do think that internet is really good out there, at least where the community I'm from. And so you do hear about more artists coming out and performing and putting their music online. Because before it was a fluke, you know, I put my music up on MySpace in like 2005 and I had these two fellas like message me saying they wanted to sign me. You know, and my mom thought I was talking to these like, oh, I don't know. Predators? Predators. <laughs> I'm a mom, yeah. She literally thought that. Yeah, like, she's like, Daniel, you're not going to meet these people. Um, but it turns out to be really kind people, and it kind of kick-started my love for music and a possible career in it. And, uh, but that wasn't always available for people. I really lucked out on that situation because I was living in the city. My mom moved us off the reserve, but I think now people might not even have to leave the reserve to, as like uh, to get those opportunities because everything is just done on, done on the web, really. That's how I got signed recently, it's just because of being on the web and sending my music out to people. Tell me about the Seven Grandfathers. Oh, oh yes. Tell us a little bit about that. Yes, when I, when I left Manitoba in 2010, I decided that I was going to quit music and I was going to seek recovery in BC to maybe see a treatment center. And while I was there, I learned about the NA program and the AA program, which was completely new to me. I didn't know what it was, but I knew that that's how, what people did in recovery. And so when I went there, I learned about all these 
they were kind of Christian based ideas and which I thought was really helpful. And, but I kept hitting these roadblock blocks in my recovery and I never understood why. And I would find myself in these moments of doubt. And then until living on, on Vancouver Island, I came across a native fellow and he told me about uh, traditional healing. And in that I learned about the seven grandfather teachings. And all of a sudden my recovery started to get so much better. And because not only was I like learning about my culture and where I, I was reclaiming some of this uh, lost knowledge. And with that just enlightened me. And that's where I had a lot of breakthroughs in my recovery. And so I owe a lot of it to the Seven Grandfathers teachings, which just basically teaches you how to become a decent person, like just a, a, a decent person, you know? And then from there is uh, the way that you present yourself out into the world, by leading by example.
the road to recovery is maybe like a lifetime journey, right? As a lot of people can relate to. It feels like as soon as you finish one thing, you discover another thing you have to work through, you know, or new things come up. And so there's, that's always, always in my mind. But I just feel like there hasn't been enough talk in the indigenous communities about that or even having role models in that way. So I feel like a lot of the work is, needs, there's still a lot of work to be done. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of my music is still always in that vein. But now I'm trying to just like find music that celebrates life and, and, and just focus on, on that, you know? And I've, I've, I've released quite a bit of music in the last little while and all of it touches on the progression that I'm going. Um, the music, the, my re most recent EP that I put out was stuff that I re recorded 13 years ago. So in that, when I was making that record, I was on a spiral um, trajectory, just going down. So it's hard to hear those songs now because I know where my addiction was at that time. And the reason why it was shelved is because I couldn't function anymore. But it's really beautiful to put it out now that I am in recovery and have like moved way past the version of myself that was recording those songs. And so it's, it's cool. And, and now people are really responding to it. But I think that that album was like maybe a cry for help but I didn't really know how to articulate my thoughts. But they make a lot of sense now. Now that in retrospect, being able to look at it with a new, in a new perspective, any type of person would be able to relate because it comes from a very like authentic human. It comes from a very authentic place in the human experience. So I think it's a very shared, shared experience with the, everyone. Because I get, I get people young and very old who can really uh, connect with it. I write in from, from a very improvised uh, place. And so in that, I've just discovered that your subconscious kind of takes over. So if, if that's just like, um, if that's just part of who you are, it just comes out. And I think a lot of artists can relate to that. I wanna start performing more in theaters to like maybe a more mature audience who are there to listen to the songwriting. Okay. And so I hope that people see that in this and, and we can get to a new audience. Well, it's been great talking to you. Thank you for taking this time to sit down with us today. Yeah, thank you.
it's been so 